I'd like to read today from Luke's Gospel and uh, chapter 16, 16th chapter of Luke's Gospel and uh, verse 16, 16, 16. That makes it easy to remember. Here in this um, end of one year and uh, transitioning over to a new year, it makes me think about, I think it does in, in general, it makes people think about uh, ends, end of one thing, beginning of another thing. Um, for us though, as Christians, um, the, the end of one thing and the beginning of an, another thing has, has already taken place. And this is what Jesus is talking about here um, in verse 16. He says, um, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. Um, what does he mean by that? Well, first of all, the John that he's talking about is John the Baptist, who was, of course, the forerunner of Christ. John the Baptist, um, in a sense, prepared the way for, for Jesus. He was his, his uh, herald, in a sense. He prepared the way. He, uh, he said, there's one coming after me that's greater than me. So the John that he means here is John the Baptist. And, um, and he says that the law and the prophets were until John, but after that the kingdom of God is preached. Now, uh, it's true that, uh, as, as I've heard, uh, you know, sometimes people will say, well, God's the same in the Old Testament as He is in the New Testament. That's true. Um, but that, uh, that sort of disguises the point that he's making here. While God is the same in the Old Testament as He is in the New Testament, what Jesus is pointing to here is that his way of dealing with mankind is different, has changed. Uh, it's a new um, uh, administration, if we might want to say it that way. We know just what that means uh, in the United States because every four years there's an election and when a new person is elected there's a change of administration. It doesn't mean that the United States is any different than it was before. It's the same United States, but now there's a new administration. And depending on who it is, things can be way different. Isn't that right? I mean, it can be radically different depending on whose administration it is. And so what we're dealing with here is a different kind of administration. Uh, what, he, what he's saying is that before John, who is, of course, the herald of Jesus, before Jesus came, God dealt with mankind basically through a little narrow circle, uh, the nation of Israel, to whom he gave the law and the prophets. And that was his way of dealing with mankind through the nation of Israel, a very narrow and restricted circle. But now he's drawn the circle way bigger. In fact, it's a universal circle and anyone can participate. Uh, Jews, Gentiles, uh, doesn't make any difference. That's what Paul says in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither male nor female, bond nor free. All human distinctions are done away with and everyone has a has access to God. And what he calls it here is the kingdom of God. And he says every man uh, is entering into it. I like the way the message says it. Phil, if you could give me the message. I think it makes this point really clear. Um, he says God's law and prophets climaxed in John. Now it's all kingdom of God. And the glad news and compelling invitation to every man and woman. In other words, uh, it's a the kingdom of God has arrived and Jesus is the King, and um, it's, a, it's an invitation uh, for everyone. Everyone is welcome. Everyone can come in. I think that's a good way to, to understand this. So uh, the, the point that he's making is there's a change has taken place. Uh, it's no longer uh, the, the scenario. It's no longer the, the mood or the style or the uh, way of doing things that you read about in the Old Testament. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind um, because sometimes uh, people you know, read the Old Testament and think, well, the things that you see happening in the Old Testament, uh, God's liable to be doing those same things uh, today. And it's not true. There was a, there was a problem in the Old Testament. Uh, the problem was there was sin that had interrupted or uh, intervened or, let's see, what's a better word, uh, disturbed the relationship between God and man. And uh, God had to deal with um, individuals based on individual sin. And you find that very clearly in the Old Testament. But here's something remarkable that you find in the New Testament. You find that in the New Testament, we're 
also very clearly told that Jesus, one man, has dealt with everyone's sin, has put away everyone's sin. One man has dealt with everyone's sin. In other words, instead of God dealing with individuals based on individual sin, now He deals with everyone's sin in a universal way through Christ, through Jesus, and has put it away based on that. And now, as it says here, now it's, uh, what did he say on the message again? Now it's the, it's the kingdom of God and glad tidings, or, yeah. Now it's all kingdom of God, glad news, and compelling invitation to every man and woman. And now, I, see, I wish we could understand that, that that's what God uh, has in mind. It's all good news now. No, uh, no more wrath of God, no more anger, no more, um, you know, I think, uh, I think some Christians are disappointed with that. <laughs> Unhappy, but nevertheless, that's the way it is. Now, I was going to read a, another chapter that clearly uh, delineates these these differences or these changes, and that's in Second Corinthians chapter three. And uh, I haven't read this; I haven't read from this chapter for a long time. So I thought I'd read Second Corinthians chapter three. Um, Paul uh, clearly uh, explains this distinction, and you have to keep in mind Second Corinthians chapter three, verse one. Uh, that the, the, the Apostle Paul is not giving us his opinion. He is not telling us what he thought up or something he uh, arrived at on his own. He's giving us information that he got from Jesus. And uh, so we're, we're basically get, we're getting the same message, but through the Apostle Paul. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you. What, what is he saying? Um, well, what was happening in the church in Corinth was at, this is a church that Paul had started. These are his converts. Uh, they knew him. They had heard his preaching. They began with his preaching. But after he left and went away, uh, other ministers came in and began to bring uh, other messages that were sometimes contrary to what the Apostle Paul had brought. And evidently, um, someone, uh, evidently, uh, letters of recommendation were being shown to the Corinthians saying, look here, uh, you should listen to what we have to say because look at these letters we have from, let's say, you know, James in Jerusalem or whoever. And so Paul is now saying, do I need to do the same thing? Do I need some kind of a letter? A recommendation to you because you know this is a church that I started. You became Christians based on my preaching. Do I need to do the same? Thing? Do you need to see my resume? Do I need to give you a, you know, a, a, you know these letters of recommendation? Here's what he says in response to that verse two. He says, "You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men." In other words, I don't need to. Uh, a letter of recommendation, you are the letter, you're, you're the fruit, you're the result. I don't need to have someone else uh, write a letter for me because you, you are a living representation of, of my work. Then he says, verse 3, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, then he says, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart, or the human tables of the heart. Now he begins to make a comparison between, when he says the tables of stone, he is making an obvious reference to the Old Testament law, which was written and given to Moses on stone tablets. And that's what he means. Uh, he's making a comparison. And the comparison that he makes is the the law, the Old Testament law written on stone, and the, what he's going to say in the next few verses, the New Testament situation, which is not law written externally on stone, but written on the inside, in the heart. And verse 4, he says, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Now there's a good verse to uh, uh, take for yourself. That's a good verse for me and for you and for everybody else. He says, we're not sufficient to think anything's, uh, anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. 
So whatever it is that we're doing in life, we could uh, adopt this same attitude. This is a really practical, good attitude. Um, not that I think I'm sufficient for it, uh, but my sufficiency is of God. And the same with you. Um, you might not feel sufficient for things that you have to do, but that's okay uh, because your sufficiency is of God and He, he makes you sufficient. Uh, just like Jesus, when He was faced with uh, what seemed to be a lack when there were 5,000 or more people and there was nothing to eat, and uh, He took what seemed to be insufficient, which was a little boy's lunch of a few fish, a few pieces of bread. Think about that. If you, a few scraps of bread. And, you know, if everybody showed up at your house for Christmas dinner and all you had was a few little scraps of fish and a few little scraps of bread, you'd feel a little bit nervous. Well, think about Jesus. That's, but he, what he did was he held it up to God and blessed it. And God made what was insufficient. He made it sufficient. Isn't that amazing? So that's what Paul's here alluding to. We may be insufficient in ourselves, but God is our sufficiency. So he's got a good attitude about this. This is the right way to look at it. But remember this comparison that he made. Uh, when he, he started by saying, he said, we don't need to have a letter of recommendation because you are our letter of recommendation. And we didn't have to write it with ink, but, but Christ wrote it uh, with uh, his spirit yeah, by, in your heart, by making uh, a change in your heart is what he's saying. And he said, it's not outward in like, the, like the Old Testament law on a stone, it's on the inside. And now he's going to make this comparison a little more plain. Uh, uh, let's see. Our sufficiency is of God, verse 6, who also made us able ministers of the New Testament. Now remember, the context is you are our letter because we preach to you. Not that we think we're so great, but God made us sufficient. And he said he made us able ministers of, listen, he says, this is what we preach to you, the New Testament or the New Covenant. He says, not of the letter but of the Spirit. In other words, not of the, uh, the letter of the law, for instance, but of the Spirit. He says, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, incidentally, this is a little side thought. This gives us a little bit of insight into what whoever he's referring to that came and preached to the Corinthians that he is uh, a little bit irritated about. They, they evidently came to the Corinthians and told them that they about the Old Testament law and that they needed to observe the Jewish law. Uh, and he is here intimating that, no, that's, that's like a, uh, it, it, it's something that is uh, inferior. You have something far better than that. You don't have to have tables of stone out here that you look at. You have uh, something written on, on the inside of you, in your spirit. And he's going to make this um, comparison a little more plain even. He says, the letter kills. He's talking about the Old Testament law. I don't know, we don't think of it that way, but that's what he says here. It kills, but the Spirit gives life. You know, uh, the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots, uh, he says that kills. It, uh, it alienates uh, a person from God. But the Spirit, on the other hand, even though an individual may feel insufficient, the Spirit gives life and makes everyone sufficient. Verse 7, he's going to continue this comparison. But if the ministration of death, that's talking again about the Old Testament law, he calls it a ministration of death. Imagine that. Ministration means, uh, like I said before, when, when I said uh, a different administration, uh, dispensation, uh, something that results in, in death. If the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not, verse 8, the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious, or more glorious? Now what he's alluding to is in the Old Testament, when Moses went up on the mountain and talked to God and got the Old Testament law, which, as Paul said, had the end result of, of, of death, when he got it, when he came down, his face was glowing with the reflected glory of God. And the children of Israel, he says, could not stand to look at it because the glory was so bright. And so if you read about it in the Old Testament, uh, Moses took a veil and put it over his face to cover that. Now, Paul's going to mention that again in a minute. But what the point he's making first is, if there was glory associated with 
the inferior covenant, how much more glory is associated with this administration of life? He says, uh, and back in verse 7 again, If the ministration of death written engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, then he says, which glory was to be done away? Uh, it, was, it was impermanent. It was temporary. And if you read the story, uh, he had the veil over his face, and the glory finally faded away, and it disappeared, but they didn't know that it was gone because they were seeing a veil. But the point he's making here is it was temporary. Now with that, he says, which was done away, he says, how much, verse 8, you, you see this comparison, how, much, uh, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit, that's what the New Testament is, he administers his spirit on the inside of you to your spirit. He says it's more glorious. Verse 9, if the ministration of condemnation be glory. That's the Old Testament. Much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Now, he said that Old Testament law had the effect of bringing condemnation. But the New Testament has the effect of bringing righteousness, which is the opposite. Uh, condemnation is a pronouncement of, of guilt. And it makes you feel bad. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Righteousness is a pronouncement of not guilty, of your accepted. It's a pronouncement of acceptance. Now, by the way, this is just a little side thought again. You don't mind me giving a little side thought here. That means that uh, what we're all about as Christians is not going around straightening people out and condemning them, <laughs> but bringing them life. That means other people that you run into, if somebody says something to you that makes you feel condemned, you don't have to take it. I, I don't punch them in the nose or anything, but you don't have to take it in and feel bad. People sometimes are like that. You know, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. You know, especially the holiday season, you run into lots of people. And I think some people feel like it's their God-given mission to correct everyone else. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever run into that. And, and you know, try to pinpoint where, where you're off the track and, uh, and you know, t tell you what you should have done but you didn't do. <laughs> what you should have been like but you weren't like. Uh, that is... The, that is it ends up being, in essence, is an administration of condemnation. Because all you can do with that is go away and feel bad. Well, maybe so. Now I feel terrible. Thanks a lot. Happy holidays. <laughs> you understand? Uh, that is not our mission. That is not our uh, ministry. Our ministry is the administration of righteousness. And you see this... Um, of connecting people with God, connecting, knowing that we're connected with God, knowing that He is not angry with us, He's not upset with us, He's not disappointed with us, he, in spite of the fact that we're not perfect, because He's at work in our lives. And, and I think this troubles some Christians who feel like it's their job to straighten everybody out because they feel like if I don't go around straightening everybody out, how are they going to be corrected? Well, you've got to give God a little credit for... <laughs> You've got to give the Holy Spirit a little bit of um, you know, credit for being... He, he can do a few things without your help. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> you know, sometime, so, somewhere down the line, we're going to have to believe what it is that we give lip service to. That, that the Holy Spirit really is real. Jesus really is real. And that He really can, and He's really able to deal with us and others directly. He's able to do that. Um, so, he says, the ministration of condemnation, that was the Old Testament, uh, much more does the administration of righteousness, of rightness. The, the New Covenant is an administration, a ministration of rightness with God, of a proclamation that you are right with God, apart from whether or not you've done anything to achieve it, because you didn't. He did. It's His righteousness. It's not yours, uh, it's His. But He did it for you so that you could have a clean and an open relationship with God that nothing can intervene. 
Nothing can come between. Nothing can interrupt it. Verse 10, for even that which was made glorious, that's now he's talking about the Old Testament, had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. He says, so great is, so much better is this new covenant situation that it, by comparison, it totally you know, overshadows the glory of the Old Testament. Verse 11, for if that which is done away was glorious, now again, he's, he's alluding to what he just said about the glory on Moses' face, but he says that's, the, that's an analogy for the whole Old Testament law. He says, that which is done away is glorious. It's pretty bold for him to say that, but nevertheless, there it is. That which is done away was glorious, um, and he says it's done away. That scares some people, but don't be scared. We've got something better. <laughs> um, I know it's hard to... It's hard to imagine it, uh, but it's true. That which is done away was glorious. Much more, that which remains is glorious. Uh, we have something that's permanent, that never goes away. Verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. In other words, we're just going to lay it out on the line and tell it how it is. Verse 13. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. He's making very subtle analogies here. He's saying uh, it's by him putting a veil over his face, it's the same as saying one thing but having another message behind it. Um, not as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. They didn't know that it had gone away. What's the analogy he's making? Well, in Paul's day, uh, the people that are still preaching the law and trying to bring the Christians under the law and still holding on to that, they didn't know that it was done away. Verse 14, But their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. In other words, as a Christian, we can see things more clearly as they truly are. Um, and Paul is Jewish himself, and so he knows what he's talking about. Um, he's saying they don't see the truth yet, and there's a veil on their minds. There's, a, there's something in between them and the truth. Verse 15, But even unto this day, when Moses is read, that veil is upon their heart. Do you know, um, this reminds me of an incident I read in Luke's Gospel. Not just that I've read it, everybody's read it, but <laughs> an incident in Luke's gospel. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, some of his disciples were walking on the road to a town called Emmaus. And Jesus came along and walked with them, and they didn't recognize him. You've read that story before? He walked with them, but they didn't recognize him. That's, that's odd, isn't it? But there was, there was a veil uh, on their heart, you might say. And then it says that what Jesus did about it, here's, here's how he, he, at first he said, why are you so sad? And they said, well, haven't you heard about Jesus? And we believed he was, you know, the one sent from God. They're telling Jesus this. <laughs> they don't recognize him. And so the way he dealt with that, he, it says, it specifically says that beginning with Moses and the prophets, he began to, to tell them about all the things concerning himself. Now, Ordinarily, if you read the Old Testament, you're not going to find stories about Jesus there or things about Jesus. But it's written in a, in, a, uh, in a veiled or a spiritual way. And really, all the things that you actually read in the Old Testament are pointing towards Jesus. The ark, Noah's ark, is a picture of Jesus. Uh, because the ark delivered them out of the old world into the new world. Uh, there's pictures of Jesus everywhere. And it says that he told them about all those things. But now he's saying, when they read Moses, there's a veil on their heart. Verse 16, Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, it means a person. When a person, that's what he means. Nevertheless, when a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So, as a Christian, you don't have anything separating between your mind and, and God and the truth. Verse 17, Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, you should be glad about that, because he's saying what we have is access to God, direct access to God, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, he said, there's liberty. There's not bondage. 
There's not um, requirements. You're not bound up. You're not tied up. You're not restricted. Uh, it's liberty. Verse 18. But we all, and this is by that he means all of us, uh, everyone. It's available to everyone. But we all with open face, that is to say no veil, beholding, listen to this, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now this is really a remarkable thing that he says here. He says that as Christians, we're not like the situation that you find in the Old Testament where God was at a distance and there was a veil hanging between the, the, the individual and God. The veil is taken away and he says, with open face, we're beholding, this is really remarkable, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. By a glass, he means uh, a mirror. Now, what, what do you generally see when you look in a mirror? Yourself. Yeah. That's, isn't that remarkable that now he's suddenly talking about looking in a mirror and seeing the glory of the Lord. Now, that's not something that we ordinarily think about. Um, we are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And he says, as we do that, he says, we are changed into that same image. Well, it's obviously then not us that's doing the change. It's him. See, this is why, um, this is why it's, it's not necessary to go around straightening everybody out because he's able to change. He's able to change uh, as we behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. It says, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory. It gets better and better, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. He does it, is what Paul is saying. Phil, do you have the message translation there? I think it's really good. All of us, nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of His face. And so we are transfigured, much like the Messiah. Let me stop right there for a minute. You know what he's, what he's intimating there is when he says we are transfigured. Uh, in the King James it says uh, we are changed. And this is the same word that's used uh, when it talks about Jesus transfigured on the mountaintop in the Gospels. It says that Jesus went on a mountaintop and was transfigured before them and he was changed. And his countenance began to, to shine and his clothes began to shine. Um, and they saw him, uh, the glory coming out of the inside, glory coming from the inside out. And he's saying that the same thing is happening with us as we, what does he say here? Uh, and so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. Isn't that a great thought? Now, the thing I like about uh, what we read in the, in the King James translation, if you can go back to that, Phil, just for a second. When he says, he says, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Listen to this, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What, what that tells me is that this is his work and something that he can accomplish. Now, uh, I don't know if you've ever labored under the, the, the sense that Christianity was a big job that you had to carry out. <laughs> I, uh, I had that thought for a long time. And the more you uh, think of it that way, the harder it gets. And, uh, and, the, and the more you think you're doing it and the more you try to do it, um, the more you find that you're failing at it and not, not good at it. <laughs> Don't know if anybody's ever had that experience besides, besides me. But you see, this is a job that's too big for you. It's a, too, a job that's too big for me. And uh, what he says here is, it's a job, this, this looks like a job for the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like one of those uh, superhero TV shows. This looks like a job for Superman. You know? <laughs> well, this looks like a job for the Holy Spirit here. Uh, I remember, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Joyce Meyer, if you've ever seen her on television and seen her books. She's, she's all around. She's pretty well known. But I remember watching her on television one time, hearing her tell this story about how she, uh, in her earlier Christian life, was laboring under that same impression that, you know, going to church and, you know, hearing about all the things you're supposed to be doing. And she got this idea that it, 
it was just, you know, I, it's a, it's a, it's a self-improvement task, and I am working, and I'm trying, but she says, and this was my experience too, she said, the harder I tried at it, the more aware I became that I was failing <laughs> at it, and, <laughs> and it made me frustrated, and when I got frustrated and upset, the, that, that also contributed to me, you know, it fouled me up and made me in a bad mood and a bad temper, and uh, finally she said, I, you know, she had uh, lost her temper and said something she shouldn't have said, or done, I forget what all this, what all happened. But she was so upset, she just w went away in the bathroom, and she just, just sat down on the floor and started crying. And then she just prayed, and she <laughs> cried out to God, and she says, "Lord, that's it, I give up." <laughs> and she said, she felt like the Lord spoke to her heart and said, "That's what I've been waiting to hear." <laughs> That's what I've been waiting for, for you to give up and let me do it. So sometimes uh, for us to come to that point of re realization that we can't do it uh, is just the very thing we need. Because this is what he's talking about here is uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, as you can see by this comparison, what we started off with is a new administration. Now, it's not new in 2019. It's new 2,000 years ago. And we've been living in this administration of the kingdom of God. Now, of course, we haven't been living all that time, but uh, it, we're a part of it. The kingdom of God is present among us. You remember what Jesus said when the, dis, the Pharisees came to Him and they demanded uh, when the kingdom of God should come. They evidently heard Him talking about it like we just read. He said, well, okay, Jesus, when will this kingdom of God come? And He says, the kingdom of God does not come with outward observation. In other words, not like you're thinking. Not out here. He says, neither do, uh, do men say low here or low there? Now see, it's not outward. That's what he's saying. But he says, by comparison, the kingdom of God, he said, is within you. It's not out here, it's in here. And that's the very thing that Paul is talking about. The same, you know, there's, this, there's a large scale view of it, the kingdom of God like in the world, but then there's this small scale view of it, the kingdom of God as it relates to me. And we are just as bad as the Pharisees sometimes saying, where is it? You know, but we're looking in the right. It's not out here, it's in here. But as we have just read, it doesn't just stay in here, it grows. And as we consider it, now this is the point I was going to make. He said that we, with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, as we ponder and consider our personal connection to it, ourselves as part of it, he says, it transforms us. We are changed. We are transformed. And if you think that's too big a job, that it's too big, well, it's maybe too big for you, but it's not too big for Him. He is at work in your life and in my life, transforming us, causing us to reflect uh, His life. Okay, I think that's all I got. Let's all stand up today.